I don't know if I don't have any underlinings in this. It makes me think I have not looked. Yeah, at we it. what we do is we just read through it and then talk about it paragraph by paragraph. That's so uh, I'll be catching up, uh, and when you come back, uh, we can start wherever y'all want to start. Okay. All right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, this is the end of the sixth year of the Carl Jung Depth Psychology Reading Group on YouTube. Um, next, the next time we meet uh, after June the 1st, uh, we will be in the seventh year of this group. And we now have over 1,300 videos on this YouTube channel. Um, and so tonight, uh, I have a, a new panelist, uh, Robert Bannister, who uh, tells me that he is a retired uh, psychotherapist. And I'm going to, first of all, tell him a little bit about the Confluence we'll be running. And then this, just for everyone's information, uh, tonight will be the last one of these classes for three weeks. Um, we will resume uh, these Monday night classes on, um, well, I have to get the date here. It will be uh, June the 20th will be the next Monday night class when we will begin uh, in two essays with Anima and Animus. Uh, but tonight we're going to uh, complete the <clears throat> functions of the unconscious. And so, but before I do that, I want to say a few things about why we're not going to be meeting. Uh, strictly speaking, we could meet next week, but uh, I don't want to open uh, the anima animus discussion and then have to leave for, for conflict. So uh, what we're going to do is postpone uh, the beginning of that section of the book. Uh, and this is the book we're reading, which is two essays on analytical psychology, volume seven of the collected works of C.G. Young. And we will begin the anima animus section on page, uh, 188, and it's paragraph 296, we'll, we'll begin that on the 20th of June. Now, between now and then, um, I will be participating with my six colleagues in what we call uh, our confluence. It's called the creator's art, and I'm going to put the... Um, the YouTube, I'm sorry, the URL in the uh, YouTube channel. I'll put it here also for you, uh, Bob, in case you haven't seen it. Um, this is the um, this is the website of what we're doing, and you should be able to see that in the chat. But yes. um, this had an interesting evolution, okay, because a year ago, um, in, on May the 7th, 2021, uh, I spent one day with uh, my colleague, Tim Holmes, and Tim is um, an internationally renowned artist, mostly as a sculptor, um, but I had decided to ask him to do my portrait. And so I flew to Helena to be with Tim. And after that day on my way back to Annapolis where I live, um, I was trying to figure out what Tim and I could do together um, that would be fulfilling for our life's work because Tim uh, is descended from six generations of Methodist ministers, uh, very much as C.G. Young was 
descended from six generations of Swiss reform ministers. And Tim has been part of a reading, a young reading group at his church, believe it or not, at his church for the last 35 years. And so he and I have been studying uh, side by side with unbeknownst to one another um, for all of that time. But about three years ago, Tim uh, joined my advanced reading group and we started the interact in the spring, or I'm sorry, in the fall of 2019 now, um, I did an interview with Tim online, which is, you can find on the, on the YouTube channel homepage. It's an interview with Tim Holmes. And um, that interview, we had some problems with it because uh, Tim wanted to use some music that got kanked because of copyright issues. So we had to resolve that. And so it took us four days to get this interview published. But in that four days, I felt like I had known Tim for 30 years. Um, and it was very much like, I don't know if you ever saw the Star Trek episode, but there was a Star Trek episode in which um, Jean-Luc Picard has a little device and it flashes him and he goes unconscious on the Enterprise, but in his unconscious, he lives 30 years. And he has a wife and th raises three children on another planet. And then all of a sudden he wakes up on the Enterprise. Now in Enterprise time, this was only 30 seconds later, but Jean-Luc Picard had lived this entire life on this other planet. And um, the unique thing about it was that on the other planet, he learned to play the flute and so back on the Enterprise, he had a flute and he could still play it. It was just a little, little special little flute. And um, so I had an experience like that with Tim where, um, you know, our lives, um, I think, intertwined. You know, we didn't do the same things, but our lives intertwined in such a way that that we really felt like we'd known each other for quite a long time. And so I suggested that we um, recruit some other artists. I know some wonderful artists um, and, uh, and that we hold this event in Helena in his studio, his 7,000 square foot studio in Helena, Montana. And so he agreed and we have been putting it together for the last year, six of us. And as I said earlier, including one of us who's a, a psychologist and one of the founders of the uh, Young Society of Washington and um, 45 years ago, by the way, and uh, one who is uh, a retired psychiatrist from, um, from Sebastopol, California. And uh, we all bring something uh, creative to the party. Um, and the thing that three of us, the psychiatrist and uh, the woman poet, Sherry Loveler and John Jackson and I will be doing um, Murray Stein's play and Henry Abramovich's play called The Analyst and the Rabbi. And uh, are you familiar with that play? Okay, so um, we got Murray and um, Henry to agree to allow us to do the play and I'll be playing C.G. Young in the play. So this is why I have this mustache and I even have a little bit of uh, makeup, uh, graying makeup <laughs> so that my, my mustache will be whiter and my eyebrows will be whiter. I think my hair is pretty good <laughs> already. Um, and so, and John and I are both in our seventies. So it, we're the right age for the parts. And um, 
So we're going to perform this play on June the 12th. I'm going to try to broadcast it on the YouTube channel. I'm not sure I'll be able to broadcast it, but at the very minimum, um, we're going to make a recording, a video recording of the play, and we have a professional videographer that's going to record it as well. Uh, he won't have it right away, but I, th I think within a few days, we'll be able to get uh, a recording of it up on this YouTube channel. And it will also appear on timholmesstudio.com, which is his uh, YouTube channel. And good evening, Art Patterson. Nice to see you this evening. Um, and uh, yes, it will be multi-camera, uh, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, hopefully they'll still be working by then. And uh, it's been an incredible journey to uh, perform this play and do the rehearsals because Sherry and John have now become a couple. They became engaged about two weeks ago and uh, they were already a couple when I met them, but uh, they now have announced it's official. And uh, so they live in California and I live in Annapolis, Maryland. Tim lives in Helena, Montana. And Tim is serving as the um, director and producer and also the jack of all trades in terms of the lighting and everything. Uh, so we've been doing it over Zoom incredibly and it seems to have worked out so far. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Um, but what I wanted to talk to you about, tell you about, is what we came around to. I mean, originally, I thought it was about helping Tim promote his work, because he lives in the small city, Helena, Montana. It's the capital of the state, but it only has 32,000 people in it. And originally, I, in the first week, I would say that we were thinking that it was, or I was thinking that it was mainly about getting some people to come to his studio because it's kind of out of the way. Um, but uh, we've gone way beyond that now. And I've realized that we have a, a terrible spiritual malaise in the country. Um, and it's, uh, it's summarized by this story. While I was on active duty in the Marine Corps, I served in Vietnam and um, I was at a place called Combat Base Baldy, which was about or is about 40 miles south of Da Nang. And it was the headquarters of the 5th Marines, the 5th Marine Regiment. And uh, I was, believe it or not, the POW camp commander on that base. And uh, I was an interrogation officer and a POW camp commander. And um, as a result, I had to attend the, the colonel's, uh, the commanding officer of the regiment's daily brief at 8 a.m. every day, every, every day. And on Mondays, uh, the chaplain would show up and he would say, well, we had uh, 12, 11 or 12 uh, Marines in chapel yesterday. And at the, that number struck me because we had 5,000 Marines on that combat base. <laughs> and we all, there were only 11 or 12 that were showing up for chapel. And of course, there's always that old saw that, uh, you know, there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, um, Anyway, they, if they were non-atheists, they weren't going to church, and even though it was available. And I think at the time, Colonel Judge probably just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I guess they don't want to go to chapel, so that's fine. And he probably didn't even give it any thought at that time. And the chaplain was a commander in the Navy, should have known a little better, I think, but uh, he had a beautiful chapel up on the top of this hill uh, overlooking the 
East China Sea. And um, the Navy had given him saran wrap that was printed like uh, stained glass windows. So he had these stained glass, saran wrap stained glass windows in the, in the bunker that had been built for him out of sandbags, but that was the chapel. And it had uh, pews and the whole smash. And I remembered that. And then as we've been going forward, I realized, and especially from this play, I don't know if you are familiar with the play, but it's in part, it's about um, what a Jewish community did to keep from going insane, to maintain their sense of humanity uh, in the concentration camps. Um, and, um, and John Jackson, who plays Rabbi Leo Beck, um, talks in the plays, one of his parts is to talk about all the different things that they did. They had operas, they had, um, you know, original chamber music, they had plays, uh, they had cabaret. And nowhere in there does he mention rel religious services, okay? But they did all these things. And so as I was thinking about it, I was remembering, first of all, I never saw the chaplain except for Mondays at the, at the colonel's brief. And so he never took care of my spiritual needs. <laughs> and it, it came back to me that, you know, this chaplain really wasn't fulfilling the spiritual needs of the troops. He, he just wasn't doing his job. Uh, and by the, by the title chaplain, that's his duty, okay? It's not his duty to make more Southern Baptists. It's his duty to fulfill, to, you know, address the spiritual needs of the troops. And nothing, I never heard anything that he did uh, other than these, uh, you know, one sentence <laughs> report on Monday mornings. And I remember that in the, as a, came toward Christmas time uh, of 1970, uh, I was told that I would not be able to go to the Bob Hope show. And I was crushed by that. I was spiritually crushed because I've been looking forward to being able to get away for a night and see this show that I'd watched maybe four or five times on television um, before going to Vietnam. Every year they would have a special of the show that he had done. And I wasn't going to be allowed to go. I was terribly crushed by that. And, um, and then <laughs> about a week later, I got dysentery and I got medevac to the Navy hospital in Da Nang. And because I was in the hospital, um, I got to go to the show. I got to go to the Bob Hope show, but this time I got to go wearing a hospital blues, <laughs> a hospital blue outfit. And my spirits just went sky high again because of that. And, um, and so I was thinking about that and thinking about this element of this play that we're doing. And really, there's so much that can be done to help our society with its spiritual malaise, but right now we all have these, you know, these cells or cabins where, you know, the, the Southern Baptists are over here and the Presbyterians are here and the Catholics are here and the Jews are here, et cetera, and they don't talk to one another. And so what this confluence has become is a way to open up, um, the spiritual life of the people that attend and maybe to a limited extent, the people who view this video and other videos, because the, we're, we are going to uh, broadcast quite a lot of it if we can. Uh, there's certain sessions that we won't broadcast. Uh, for example, there's a nude modeling session that we won't be broadcasting, but, um, 
although I'm sure everybody would be happy if we did that, but <laughs> we're not going to do that. <laughs> um, but, and uh, I'll tell you a little story out of school. Tim is going to demonstrate alchemical modeling where the, the model and the artist interact with one another. And um, they, they just try to get a, an emotional response from one another. And that causes the evolution of the modeling session, which then Tim is drawing mostly. And one of the stories he had was that one day his model goes over and he, she gets a meat cleaver out of her, out of his drawer in his kitchen. And she walks up to him and goes, whack, right down between his legs on, on his chair. <laughs> it got his attention. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's going to have any meat cleavers around, but anyway, we, we won't be broadcasting that session. So sorry, be there or be square. <laughs> Do you have any comments, sir, so far of what I, about what I've said? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to comment. Okay, that's all right. You don't have to say anything. Um, okay, so anyway... Um, so the confluence is more addressing a comment that was made by, um, by Dr. Lawrence Yaffe, who is the son of Agnella Yaffe. And he wrote this book called Liberating the Heart, um, Spirituality and Union Psychology. Unfortunately, he died in 1963, so we can't talk to him. But one of the things that he wrote in this book on page 41 is um, a sentence that sums up Jungian psychology in one sentence. And that sentence is this, the purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that, he that healing power which resides in our unconscious. I'll read it once more. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. And it came to me that that is also what all religions do. <laughs> and um, and that, that is as long as you don't think God is up there, but God is within. Um, then God is, um, religions are trying to open up the healing power of the unconscious. And also art does that. And so um, this confluence is the idea of bringing all these things together in one place. Um, and, uh, and to show the healing power of all of these spiritual traditions, they're not, they shouldn't be enemies, they should be friends. So repeating it once again, uh, at, at Robert's request, um, the purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power, which resides in our unconscious, the healing power. And I think you'll probably remember that uh, Dr. Jung was very taken by a poem by Holder, and it's called Patmos. And in that, in that poem, Holder says, um, whenever a trauma, in effect, what he's saying is whenever some trauma occurs, what's also close by is the healing power, okay, is the healing power. And, and it's a question for 
psychologists to um, to open that up for people so that they can see the healing power. And obviously, um, when we have the president of the United States going to Uvalde this week and to Buffalo two weeks ago, um, he is in that same business. He's opening up the healing power uh, that is in the unconscious of the com community and showing each suffering person that they're not alone in their suffering, that we are, um, we're all suffering from that. And I heard a wonderful, um, wonderful sentence in a, um, a Christian service uh, yesterday that my mother-in-law happened to be watching on our television because uh, we have a big screen. So we on Sunday, she comes over and watches her service. And the pastor said, um, uh, prayer does not change things. Prayer changes us and we change things. And that's a perspective that I think is sort of a new way of thinking about prayer because we, we've been sending all these thoughts and prayers as if it's, um, as if somehow magically somebody else is gonna take care of it, but it isn't somebody else, it's us. We have to make the changes. And um, I saw a, another interesting uh, approach by, um, the press to a Methodist minister in Kentucky uh, last spring, whose church had just been leveled by a tornado. And uh, he was asked, you know, why does God do these things? And the pastor said, well, God doesn't create tornadoes. God is about how we treat one another after the tornado. And, you know, this is the kind of healing message that I think we all need, um, whether it comes from a, a pastor or whether it comes from a poet like Holderin or it comes from Lawrence Yaffe, who is uh, the son of one of the closest disciples of Carl Jung. And good evening, uh, Jordan, you're here. Hey, Skip. <laughs> oh, oh, my. So keep going. That was it. That was the long you soliloquy yesterday. <laughs> you do them well. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, meet Robert Pannister, who's joined us tonight. Um, hey, Robert. Robert, Robert is you. Robert is a retired um, psychologist, psychotherapist, and um, we haven't started the reading for tonight, so I'm going to do that now. <laughs> And um, uh, seven, is it seven nine uh, two ninety two two ninety two one eighty four page one eighty four. So we're at one page one eighty four of this book, and uh, we are going to read uh, each paragraph and then have whatever commentary comes to mind, and you can either participate or not as you wish. Uh, Robert. Um, so page 292, and this is in the, par in the chapter entitled The Function of the Unconscious. And I will read paragraph 292. Since it is highly probable that we are still a long way from the summit of absolute consciousness, presumably everyone is capable of wider consciousness. And we may assume accordingly that the unconscious processes are constantly supplying us with contents, which, if consciously recognized, would extend the range of consciousness. Looked at in this way, the unconscious appears as a field of experience of unlimited, unlimited extent. If it were merely reactive to the conscious mind, we simply aptly call it a psychic mirror world. 
in that case, the real source of all contents and activities would lie in the conscious mind. And there would be absolutely nothing in the unconscious except the distorted reflections of conscious contents. The creative process would be shut up in the conscious mind and anything new would be nothing but conscious invention or cleverness. The imperial, empirical facts give the lie to this. Every creative man knows that the spontaneity is the very essence of creative thought. Because the unconscious is not just a reactive mirror reflection, but an independent productive activity, its realm of experience is a self-contained world having its own reality of which we can only say that it affects us as we affect it. Precisely what we say about our experience of the outer world. And just as material objects are the constituent elements of this world, so psychic factors constitute the objects of that other world. Okay, Jordan. You know, the visual language and symbols through this lifelong strike chords to resonate in the imagination. And that rings the doorbell to the portal of the creative wellspring of the unconscious as Jeff says, or as Edinger said, to well up nourishing contents for the psyche. Yep. And I look at this as instead of um, a product, the merit quality or actual value is in the process. Rather the product ends up being, the mastery isn't, oh, I've, I've realized it. And oh, now I'm all that. It's mastery leads to further discovery. And I think exactly. I love the quote um, that you've brought up about the nourishing contents of the psyche because yeah. to me that when i say imagination strikes chords you know strikes chord struck in the imagination rings the doorbell to the portal of the creative wellspring unconscious wells up contents then the purpose is those contents are nourishing and i love that 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 really to me like making a souffle wraps those egg whites around to really give it some room to roam yeah to open and, up and uh bob you can pop uh robert you can uh, speak up at any time but i'll just proceed unless you i hear you saying something uh, well uh i i will make a comment uh so after uh, 35 years in practice mm -hmm. uh, uh as fate would have it i've uh, worked with a number of artists, musicians, mm -hmm. visual artists, sculptors, poets. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I would encourage them to uh, bring uh, in uh, to my office uh, samples of their work. Mm -hmm. And earlier on, uh, uh, before I learned something, uh, I would ask this question. I would say, uh, uh, and what were you thinking when you produced this? Or, and what does this piece mean to you? Uh, mm -hmm. what, what is being said? And I think without exception, uh, 35 years without exception, they are uh, loath to talk about the artwork. Uh, and this one poet uh, that I still remember, uh, I asked her, you know, what this poem was. And she says, uh, oh, I get it. You're a hack. <laughs> and, oh, goodness. And I said, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, young and stupid. Now I'm just stupid. Uh, 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 I, I didn't quite appreciate uh, the meaning of hack. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, I, I went and looked it up. And my older brother, uh, a poet and a musician, uh, 
you know, he was very happy to sort of explain to me what a hack was because I had been asking him for a long time what his music and poetry was about. And uh, he would get irritated. Mm. So, uh, so it's an interesting thing going back to the, uh, this paragraph. Uh, I, I, I agree completely. Yeah. How, how uh, do you define it now, though? But, but what is a hack? Uh, a hack. Uh, you know, the old saying, uh, you know, teachers teach, artists do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a hack is somebody that just, I don't know, uh, writes a criticism of whatever the art is, but the artist does the art has this connection with the unconscious and and allows the unconscious to uh, sort of possess him and uh, create this art or write this poem uh, or create this music and then uh, they seem to have uh, a great reluctance uh, to uh, somehow try to make it conscious. Uh, they want it to stand on its own. Mm -hmm. And why the hell are you messing with their art? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I think we have a little different perspective in that we think that everyone should be doing creative work, not only the people that call themselves art artists or poets or what have you, but everybody. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a God awful painter. I have sold some paints or paintings and I have sold some calligraphy, but um, I don't claim to be an expert artist. Um, but I know that when I'm doing art, um, my life works better. And as we've been studying it in the, in the Red Book, uh, I especially have been studying it in the Red Book. Um, it, it's about one's soul. And I think that the reason that artists maybe don't want to talk about it is you know, you're asking them something that's even too personal. It's, it is their soul. Mm -hmm. And um, I recall one time I was in a pastel class uh, at our, our local uh, high school had to split or was split in white school and black school. And when desegregation came, they had to build a new high school to handle everybody in the same school. And so they gave the old high school over to the arts. A wonderful thing in my city of 72,000 people, because it means we have a, a symphony orchestra and a ballet company and uh, an opera company and many other things. Uh, but by and large, they're, they're um, laymen. Uh, but we do have some fine artists and the classrooms were each given over to a different art. And so I was, uh, and it's mainly for adult education, right? And so I was taking this pastel class and the teacher was coming up behind me. Uh, it was a portrait class. And so here's a man who's there to have his portrait painted with pastels and I'm working on it teacher comes up behind me and says oh well you have to do it this way you have to do it this way and uh this goes over here and I looked over at her and I said no I don't <laughs> yeah and you know between uh, I think that and I appreciate Robert that you brought that up the teachers teach and artists do because my dad was a professor a professor a poet he was in Poet Laureate of Texas in 2000. And the interesting thing about the hack piece where this comes in is I remember being at one of his poetry readings and someone came up and said, well, yeah, Mr. Hoggard, um, those who can do and those who don't teach. And he said, that just clearly says you're afraid of your own psyche. 
Yeah. And yeah. then he was up and reading. And here's where it flips. Because he gave that. And that's robust and true. And understood you're heading off to dinner. Um, but he, someone in, at the end of one of his poems said, what does that mean? And here's where it flips. He said, okay, if you insist, I'll read it again. <laughs> So, you know, it's, it was both. So I, I appreciate your, your story there about, you know, without fail, 100% of the time, a lot of artists kind of get the, you know, oh, I'm already done with that work. It's you, the reviewer's job to do that. But there's kind of a plateau of keeping yourself undeveloped in savant land, because you're not actually juicing up your process with what you learned, what you share from yourself, self-awarely with the art, from the art. You're almost like you're just kicking them off like Play-Doh Fun Factory, yeah. so. Yep, okay, so Robert had to go to dinner. The and, dinner was. And um, uh, so I will save my Vietnam <laughs> painting until that he comes back since you've seen, him a few, seen it a few times. Um, well, that'll be a good one for that. To share for the them. for that further discussion, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, um, uh, you know what we firmly believe. I firmly believe, and I think Jordan does too. Uh, although I don't pretend to speak for you, Jordan, but um, we firmly believe that everybody needs some sort of artistic outlet outlet it doesn't have to be a traditional painting or sculpture or dance or any such thing uh, in large part what we're doing in the confluence the next three weeks um, is is my artistic activity is bringing people together and it isn't the actual performance so other than the play you won't probably see me uh, actually doing anything in the confluence, but I, I will be acting. So I guess that's a, that's an art form also, but. Um, well, and I think also in that, what's really important there about what you just said, and I, I'll kind of co-opt Jung's word belief and say, yes, I do. I, I do. But more it's that I think, and I think not to put words in your mouth, we both have a deep knowing that that's one of the most important things and as you've said before, you know, the purpose of art in schools is not to make artists, it's to make more balanced individuals who have a breadth and a robust perspective, literally, of law, architecture, yeah, medicine. But I, I, I don't think art teachers in school even understand that. No, and I agree. And, They're kind and, of in the, yeah. and, and we need to help them understand because you're not going to live a fulfilled life unless you can uh, communicate with your soul mm -hmm. and, and your soul expresses itself in various forms of art. And uh, if you don't, it, it makes absolutely no difference, whatever, if you ever sell anything, you're not mm -hmm. doing it so that you can sell something you're doing it so that you can express your create creative being and thereby feed your soul. And so, you know, uh, a mother who produces a beautiful dinner for the family, a very artistic dinner where she puts things on the plates and delivers it on, you know, around the table and so on, that's an art form. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, a, it's a creative activity. And all those things um, we need. And if you, if you do those things over a period of time, boy, you you become quite good at it. I mean, I I you, remember I remember my mother fed us a lot of pork chops when I was growing up because the meat was cheap, and probably five days a week we had pork chops, but somehow she made those dinners different every time mm -hmm. and um and 
she became a wonderful cook. She could have been a Julia Childs if she had had the appropriate opportunity for that. But she had a fulfilled life, an extremely fulfilled life. And she was a force of nature as a result. But mm -hmm. anyway, um, okay. Um, I'm in a well, that's, that's That's important. I think, especially in that context of art activating the psyche first and then nourishing it there with always forward. And it's also not thinking the soul to death, not putting it on the witness stand, so to speak. You and I both, you know, you have a bigger legal background than I do, but my expert witness work was, you know, I had as much law as architecture in a mm -hmm. sense from conceptually, you know, mm -hmm. not so much terms of art and torque precedent, but um, the soul doesn't need words. And it speaks in symbols and it speaks in images and it speaks through art. And that is its fluid fluency. And, you know, someone says, well, how did you learn that? Well, I went to the source. Well, what books did you read? The source. I experienced it. They're like, oh, well, you're, you're, and you're an intuitive reader this way or whatever. And I said, no, no, no. If the military drops a guy in France and tells him, learn French. The total, total immersion does not make him an intuitive speaker. It makes him a fluent speaker. Yeah. And so I think the fluency with the visual realm, spent symbols, images, uh, whatever forms they come in, is a natural way for the soul to speak and for us to learn to how to listen to it. Instead of trying to listen to it with our words, you listen to it more like with Latin. It's more of a conceptual language. There's an right. idea in each, you know, to relegare or what have you. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, people sometimes ask me, well, how do you decide which thing is right for you? And my answer is, I'm going to list four retail stores. I think it's four. And you just, you decide intuitively which one would you like to visit so one is an art store one is a uh, kitchen supply store um, one is the tool department at sears and um what else okay one one is the the local uh farmer's market let's say okay and which, which of those would you like to go to first? And that probably gives you some direction in terms of, um, you know, or would you like to go see a ballet or, you know, go attend a, a, uh, an orchestral concert? Um, that gives you some direction. And then from that direction, if you go to Michael's or you go to a uh, kitchen supply store and just walk up and down the aisles, don't not with no special idea of what is the thing that you want, whatever speaks to you, that's the thing you should pick up. That's and, the thing. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, it might be in a Michael's, it might be clay, it might be drawing, it might be, uh, you name it. Uh, but if you pick that up and start to work with it, pretty soon it, it gets to be not awful. <laughs> right? No, it does. It does. And it's like movies try to show that when they have the mathematician and all of a sudden he's going into this, the kitchen shop art supply store of his calculus. And they, you see Sigma, you see all the differential equations, you know, Diffie Q, et cetera, all floating around in this montage around his head. And this is what's happening. And it's an artistic gesture of what's allegedly going on in his mind. What it is, he's he has all that. He's waiting for one to go, whoom, and yeah. you know, and just pull pop itself out. And um, I, math jokes visually, the cartoons always kind of get me because, like, when you get the sheep herder, and he the sheep dog is go round up the sheep, and so he, the dog does, and you know, of course, it's a cartoon, so the dog can talk. Um, and, you know, there's nothing strange about a dog talking in the cartoon. Um, and then he comes back and the dog's sitting there wagging his tail, patiently sitting in the counter. The farmer says, well, how many did you count? He said, 30. He said, there are only 26. He said, round them up. <laughs> 
you know, so there's a whole, yeah. you get some leeway in that too. I think, of, yeah. you know, what, and, what jumps out at you is the cooking supply store. And that could then say, oh, well, that's only used to make this. Okay, well, maybe I'm going to go learn how to make that in the kitchen. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, one of the things that you just brought to mind was uh, a statement that's in the first chapter of the Red Book, uh, where um, um, Jung says, uh, who told you that worship is higher than laughter? Mm. where is your measure false measure okay and yeah and that's the point that's the point there that you know you may never sell a work of art okay mm -hmm. but it feeds your soul to do it okay and so i when i was growing up i knew i knew lots of fathers of my friends who had workbenches in their basement and they had all these tools and they were uh, making furniture even my father was making furniture uh, my mother was making rugs braided rugs mm. and so on and they were always into that stuff and um, and I th always thought it was uh, for utility because we actually used these things that they, mm -hmm. they built um, and they were for utility but it was also to feed their soul and mm -hmm. to give them something to do and my and one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life with my father was that we built two boats together we we bought these uh, two boat kits over about a three-year period we built one and then we used it for a couple of years and then we bought another one so that my brother would have a boat and um and so we built these two boat kits together and he taught me how to drill and how to do all kinds of things of, of woodworking by building these boats together and uh these boats were actually awful they um they were not competitive at all i was using them for sailboat racing when i was in my early teens and and uh the rich kids all had these fiberglass boats that were very light and my father built these wooden kits and then he covered them with fiberglass so they were like double heavy weight. yeah they even <laughs> heavy <laughs> so they weren't going to break but they were um they weren't going to break but they were uh uh slow <laughs> yeah and, so, and i'm glad you brought up woodworking because even in the most amateur forms of it when for example, even when you're dealing with moldings to cover up imperfections, not yeah. where you're dealing with modernism, where, you know, that's actually more expensive. Everything's hidden, fasteners. Yeah. And, but even in building a boat, the biscuits, the dowels, the things that are connections with glue that are away from the water, mm -hmm. you know, because glue is going to melt in the water. Yeah. But there, there are literally all these hidden connections that are required to build into the boat that you don't see unless you've built it and then you don't really need to see them, but you know, they're there. And so you understand there's always more than meets the eye just from the metaphor of woodworking. Right. Okay. Now I want to just read a, a footnote before I read this next section. Um, and I'm going to read it uh, and then let you start the commentary while I answer a call of nature. Okay. okay, so first is the footnote. In cases of reports to the contrary, uh, it must always be borne in mind that the fear of spirits is sometimes so great that people will actually deny that there are any spirits to fear. I've come across this myself among the dwellers of Mount Elgon. Okay, I'm going to just leave that hanging out there and now read chapter or paragraph 293. Yeah, that's okay. a great footnote because that came up today on the plaza actually um and okay you want to talk about that then i'll let yeah, you talk you about that take... i'll be i'll be back sounds good um in regards to it, the fear of spirits is sometimes so great that people will actually deny that there are any, any spirits to fear and sometimes when people are obviously in great great trouble and you say well what's going on how are you doing oh it's fine it's fine it's fine but what's interesting about that 
is it's kind of a cloaked way to say, I'm not comfortable receiving. I can give, but I don't want to have to have help except their suffering. And in this sense, they actually deny that there are any spirits to fear. That's the, I don't want to look at the unknown because you can't think your way through spirits. There are the unexplainable, the paranormal, there are metaphysical, et cetera, et cetera, that you need to take care to have a comfortability with the not knowing so you can remove your expectations, literally inspect your expectations. And instead of blind spots, blind spots removed, you can sometimes, like cats, are they seeing something that's not there? Most likely not. And it's interesting, there's a lot of work these days too where people say, well, what about UFOs? And some psychologists have said, oh, well, UFOs are the modern version of angels. There's a, a beyond or a para or supra, beyond quality to these things. And so when the fear of spirits being so great, that's really a nod to open up to, you're getting some bigger air to grow expand, literally aspirate your heart, your life to, to take a next step. For example, a king, when it's time to grow, will break the cup. The kingdom gets bigger. Same with a queen. And so I think these, when a fear is sometimes so great, people avoid it as if it's going to go away. But what happens is it t- tends to settle in from my experience. And I'm no psychologist, but the dwellers on Mount Elgon, you get some people who are very connected to nature and they still have this same phenomenon of the not knowing can steer them to be so afraid to avoid it. And so I was just saying too, that when people, you know, in times of trouble and you say, well, you know, I see a lot going on, what's going on. And um, how can I help? You know, what's up? And they're like, oh, no, it is. Just, there's, they don't want to appear needy, except there's times there where, look, the car's on empty. Go to the gas station. The car doesn't say, oh, no, it's fine. It'll quit and strand you on the side of the road. So I think I that's an operative metaphor for that. But also when I think fear is so great, that's a real moniker as a message to it's time to grow. Because you're getting oh, something so new and so different that your expectations are literally moved off, shed like scales or like a snake skin. Right. Okay, so I'll read on with uh, paragraph 293 then. The idea of psychic objectivity is by no means a new discovery. It is, in fact, one of the earliest and most universal acquisitions of humanity. It is nothing less than the conviction as to the concrete existence of a spirit world. The spirit world was certainly never an invention in the sense that fire boring was an invention. It was far rather the, it was far rather the experience, the conscious acceptance of a reality in no way inferior to that of the material world. I doubt whether primitives exist anywhere who are not acquainted with magical influence of or magical substance, uh, parentheses, magical is simply another word for psychic, close parentheses. It would also appear that practically all primitives are aware of the existence of spirits. And that's where this footnote comes in. Going on, quote, spirit, unquote, is a psychic fact. Just as we distinguish our own body bodyliness from bodies that are strange to us. So primitives, if they have any notion of souls at all, distinguish between their own souls and the spirits, which are felt as strange and as not belonging. They are objects of outward perception, whereas their own soul or one of several souls where a plurality is assumed, uh, though believed to be essentially akin to the spirits is not usually an object of so-called sensible perception. After death, the soul, or uh, Heron 
or one of the plurality of souls, close parent, becomes a spirit which survives the dead man. And often it shows a marked deterioration of character that partly contradicts the notion of personal immortality. The Bataks of Sumatra go so far as to assert that the people who were good in this life turn into malign and dangerous spirits. Nearly everything that the primitives say about the tricks which the spirits play on the living and the general picture they give of the revenants um, corresponds down to the last detail with the phenomenon established in spiritualistic experience. And just as the communications from the beyond can be seen to be activities of broken off bits of the psyche, so these primitive spirits are manifestations of unconscious complexes. The importance that modern psychology attaches to the parental complex is a direct continuation of primitive man's experience of the dangerous powers of the ancestral spirits. Even the error of judgment, which leads him unthinkingly to assume that the spirits are realities of the external world is carried on in our assumption, which Perrin as only partially correct, close Perrin, that the real parents are responsible for the parental complex. In the old trauma story theory of Freudian psychoanalysis and in other quarters as well, this assumption even passed for a scientific explanation. <laughs> Parentheses. Well it was, said. In order, it was in order to avoid this confusion that I advocated the term uh, parental imago, close parentheses. And that calls out the distinction to me that, you know, the, the religiously racist and grew up in the academic ivory tower Freud limited himself to an amateur view of experience versus Young, who cut his teeth in the psychiatric wards where this was violent. This was a war zone of the psyche and ended up being more robust and simple, but also not so sexually judgmental. Not everything had to do with your mother, you know. And with Young, it was no, their parental imago instead of, oh, you have a mother complex or, oh, you have a dad complex. And yeah. Now, and Freud, Freud, Freud was a genius. He broke through in a lot of ways, but they're also in this, the ways like this is calling out um, that even past were scientific explanation, but that it made so much sense that it wasn't worth it. You know, it's like you, you right. just, you just sensed the heart of the matter right out of it. Right. So the point is that, that, the spirits are real, okay? They're but they're mm -hmm. real. They're real of the psyche. They're not real in the manifestation touch sense, okay? So, um, you know, it's very common for people to have uh, recently deceased relatives come back to them, and. Uh, you know, so for example, and uh, particularly in a trauma situation like Uvalde today, um, I would expect that in the next two weeks, many of those parents will have dreams in which their children come back to them in their dreams. Mm -hmm. And those are quite real. Those are the spirits of their children. Um, but they're not part of the physical world. They're part of the experiential uh, psychic world and mm -hmm. and that's the point that uh, Jung, Jung was always trying to make that that um, the psyche is real <laughs> but, completely and I think what's interesting is you know if you go to the footnote where the parental imago or imago is also taken up by psychoanalysis as uh, and well, analytical psychology by primordial image of the parent or parental archetype. And I think that's an inference to we all each have innate creator memories, cues to origin stories, 
you know, source references, I think, that live in the psyche rather than being mom and dad. There's mm-hmm. always mom and dad are kind of the carotid columns, you know, the two sculptures that hold up the beam over the doorway that you walk mm-hmm. through, like a Janus doorway. And that's that's mom and pop. But when you walk through, there's the bigger imago of that primordial parent, which is source, creator, creatrix. And I think those origin stories live in the psyche. Yeah. And that that's what we're longing for. I think people limit themselves a bit when they try to relate it only to their parents. It's the it's the metaphorical parents of how did I get here? What did I what brought me here? Yeah. Okay, uh, so reading on two ninety four, two more paragraphs. You can do t- two ninety four. All it. right, two ninety four. The simple soul is, of course, quite unaware of the fact that his nearest relations, who exercise immediate influence over him, create in him an image which is only partly a replica of themselves, while its other part is compounded of elements der- derived from himself. The imago, or imago, is built up of parental influences plus the specific reactions of the child. It is therefore an image that reflects the object with very considerable qualifications. Naturally, the simple soul believes that his parents are as he sees them. The image is unconsciously projected, and when the parents die, the projected image goes on working as though it were a spirit existing on its own. The primitive then speaks of parental spirits who return by night, revenants, while the modern man calls it a father or mother complex. I think that, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And, and surely only a part of that complex is in any way related to your actual mother and father. Right. Okay. The other major part of it is related to all the mothers and fathers that ever existed in your ancestry, going back all the way to the beginning of time. And in the sense that my father used to say that everybody in the Western world is related to Alexander the Great, uh, (laughs) you know, which, you know, is not too uh, far fetched. Um, you know, we're all related to one another in in ways that are beyond belief. I mean, they're quite, it's quite believable that we are all related to one another because we all have this, the same basic DNA, but we're all different. And, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, the parts of us that are the same uh, like a reference to parent, um, you know, that, that comes down to us through our ancestry over tens of thousands and millions of years, tens of millions of years. And so, you know, that's already preformed. And then when you're born, boom, you have a mother and boom, you have a father. And that natural part gets applied to those beings that are there. Um, but, you know, if you had a, a wet nurse, you know, you, do, you could easily be told that that was your biological mother. And, and unless somebody told you that wasn't true, you, you would go through your life thinking it was your biological mother. It's and it w- true. And it wouldn't matter. <laughs> No, not at all. And, you know, it's like when the king or queen is ready to grow, they break the cup, but the child becomes the parent of the adult, which means they turn inward. Mm -hmm. And that implosion, as it were, kicks off the mother and father to a farther distance to give your own identity a chance to to wisen up. You know, the snake sheds its skin. Look at all the pretty colors, crawls under a rock or goes in the ground while it you know, toughens up a little bit. So it's not just oyster spit, fresh flesh kind of thing. But then it comes out all refreshed as more of itself instead of being more imitative of the parent. And um, snakes were thought to be magical in ancient times because how are they moving without legs? It must be magic, you know? And 
take the masculine left side or the feminine left side, mother, masculine right side, father, but I'm not mothering and fathering myself. I am wholly being myself. So growing up, you kind of tip, you know, one foot, one side, one foot on the other, two step between mom, dad, mom, dad, you know, until you go, oh, it's time to, time to figure out my own dance. And then there go the wings and you fly the nest and no more edible complex. You know, it's like no yeah. more stick it at home. Right. Okay. One more uh, paragraph. And then All right. talk a little bit about what June is going to hold for the followers of this YouTube channel. Excellent. Um, you want to read okay. it? Yep. Paragraph 295. The more limited a man's field of consciousness is, the more numerous the psychic contents, in parentheses, imagos, which meet him as quasi-external appar apparitions. Reread, quasi-external apparitions, either in the form of spirits or as magical potencies projected upon the living people, open parentheses, magicians, witches, etc., closed parents, as a at a rather high stage of development where the idea of the soul already exists, not all the imago, imagos continue to be projected, open parentheses, where this happens, even trees, trees and stones talk, close parentheses. But one of, the other one of the other complex has come near enough to consciousness to be felt no longer strange, but is somehow open quotes, belonging, close quotes, Nevertheless, the feeling that it, in parentheses, or in quotes, belongs, is not at first sufficiently strong for the complex, the complex to be sensed as a subjective content of consciousness. It remains in a sort of no man's land between conscious and unconscious, in the half shadow, in part belonging or akin to the conscious subject, in part an autonomous being, and meeting consciousness as such. At all events, it is not necessarily obedient, obedient to the subject's intentions. It may even be of a higher order. More often than not, a source of inspiration or warning or of, open quotes, supernatural, supernatural close quotes, information. Psychologically, such a content could be explained as a partly autonomous complex that is not yet fully integrated. The archaic souls, the Ba, the A, and Ka, Ka of the Egyptians are complexes of this kind at a still higher level and particularly among the civilized peoples of the West, this complex is invariably of the feminine gender, anima, and Esus, Nasuan, I, don't, I, don't I can't. Know. I can't read the Greek yeah. um, anymore. Uh, a fact for which deeper and cogent reasons are not lacking. Right. So, uh, so I thought it was quite interesting here. A couple of paragraphs back, when he talks about um, magical is simply another word for psychic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and and, um, and so you know I remember the Olivia Newton-John song um, we have to believe we're magic and we are mm -hmm. okay, because um, you know someone can have an idea as, as Jung says someone can have an idea over here and somebody over here loses their head right uh, mm -hmm. and and that's kind of a, a kind of magic where the you know the physical world events conspire to have this guy lose his head and um and so well, and that brings in that brings in the work that was done with non-local mind where they would you know place an electron here they come in contact and then they would move it far away. They would influence the electron spin and it would change the spin on the other one. And from a distance, they even went so far as to do it with plants that they potted from cuttings of the same plant and then uh, grew to a point of relative maturity 
And I think one was in New York and one was flown, I think, to Belgium. And they would um, do various sensory uh, activities to the plant and with minor results. Um, and then one day, and it seems mean at this point, because we're now personifying plants, we're giving them this connection, like the yeah. life, the soul, they burned one of the leaves and the same leaf in that same area in the plant in Belgium turned brown. Right. And so that's, that's that kind of, connection that's beyond dna well that's for sure and uh we we talk about today quantum mechanics and quantum computing where um you know if you have if you have the plus electron in a box and the negative electron of the same atom in mm -hmm. another box that you know they'll always be opposite whichever one it is and no matter where they are in the universe and mm -hmm. and uh, the communication between them travels at faster than the speed of light uh, and I think I think there is a statistic that says that you only have to have quantum computing with about four of these 40 four zero of these functions where it's something is positive or negative uh and the its opposite side is the opposite no matter what um if you have 40 of those then then you have then you can have some phenomenal computing power that we actually have within our reach now and uh we're only just starting to uh, understand it and be able to control it, but nonetheless, it exists. Um, and well, it's like, I mean, even there's so many, honestly, I think it's interesting. That I remember in the physics department in college, there were always so many electron jokes on the wall. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw a depressed electron yesterday. Someone goes, really? Yeah, he wasn't very positive. And I mean, it's like, <laughs> and, you know the electron says to the photon have you packed your suitcase and the photon says oh, no i'm going i'm packing light <laughs> so it's like it's like you know and it's uh, they, I, I love how they cut through those but again the young's comment about humor because even victor borgia said you know she laughter is the shortest distance between two people because you mm -hmm. you have to grok it and at the same time when you grok it there's an explosive connection that goes beyond your expectation yeah and and that that very point is actually made in in our play when um when i'm called upon to laugh and uh it's it's been a um it's been a question of mine whether i will you know, in the event, in the actual performance, whether I'll be able to laugh, but so far I've been able to laugh every time I've heard the joke. And, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one, because just thinking about something fun, thinking about something funny doesn't make it happen. I mean, it's because you already, you're thinking you already got it. So there's, it's hard, because, I mean, laughing, that's a, that's a hard character act. That's, yeah. that's a hard character act. Yeah, so so far in all of our rehearsals, I've been able to laugh. I'm, I'm, uh, I continue to wonder whether I'll be able to laugh in the actual performance, but I'm expecting so. Um, I can cook up a laugh fairly easily. So. Nice. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't want to touch this with a ten foot pole, Justin. But Justin says U.S. military and intelligence agencies say UFOs are real. Guess it's a question of how the acronym is defined. Yeah, for sure. Well, um, you know, I have to contribute another joke to that. They're only UFOs until you see them. Then they're FOs. But then when you, they land, they're just O's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, that's good. I started to cut right through, but it's, you know, it's it, now it's not unidentified. Now it's not flight. It's, it's like, Okay, so let's uh, talk about planning for the future here. Um, 
I, let's see, we're going to have an advanced reading group session this Wednesday, as usual. The, the last session before Confluence will be Jordan and I meeting next Sunday morning at mm -hmm. nine o'clock Eastern time, uh, assuming that Jordan joins me at that time. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, there's a bit, we'll go to that some other time, but yeah, yeah I'll be no there. No worries. Okay. No, so no, take a road trip. <laughs> all right. So we're going to, we're going to do one session next Sunday, but this will, tonight is the last session until the 20th of June. Uh, and mm -hmm. the reason for that is that we are uh, into our confluence season where we're going to actually go to uh, Helena, Montana, and I actually performed the confluence, which we've been working on for a year, and um, and that means there won't be these regular sessions. But it doesn't mean that there won't be uh, activity on this YouTube channel because we are going to endeavor to broadcast every session that we are able to broadcast. It might not be the best uh, video. For example, we are having the play professionally uh, videographed, but on my iPhone, um, I, it won't be professionally videographed, right? It will be, uh, uh, it will be iPhone quality video and it'll be broadcast. What you see is what you get. Um, and, um, but those replays will be available on this YouTube channel. The broadcasts such as they are will be available on the YouTube channel. And so there will be material here for you folks to set your psyches into but uh, it won't be the normal um, teachings that we're, we've been working on. Um, and so three weeks from tonight, we'll begin the anima, animus section of two essays. Uh, and we, we are closing in on the end. I think we only have about another hundred paragraphs of this. And, uh, and so then we're going to, have an arm wrestle about whether we're going to just go to the red book or uh, do something else um, in this session. But anyway, there won't be any regular Monday night session for the next three weeks. The next session will be June the 20th and the sessions that are over the weekend of the 10th through 13th uh, will be catch as catch can. And so everybody click your notices, uh, follow this YouTube channel, click your notice bell so that you are informed when we are live. And uh, Jordan and I are going to most likely do a profound class on uh, the Tarot, which is Jordan's specialty. Um, and so, I'm going to call upon Jordan to uh, actually perform the, the reading, but, um, but we're going to talk about it together. Right, Jordan? Yeah, which that looks like a that, tarot choir. Tar tarot choir. And, and uh, Jordan can otherwise do all the readings on the side that he can convince people to, to do <laughs> while we're up there. Um, and so anyway, okay. Thank you very much everybody, All right. for being here and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you from Helena. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday morning from here, both, mm -hmm. both here from here and from Taos. And, um, and then after that, it'll be all from uh, Montana for a couple of weeks. So peace.